ಯಸ್ತ್ಯಕ್ತ್ವಾಪಮ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭವತಿ ಜಗತ ಅನೇಕಧಾನುಗ್ರಹಾ ಪ್ರಕ್ಷೀಣಕ್ಲೇಶಿ ವಿಷಮ ವಿಷಧರ ಅನೇಕ ವಕ್ತೃಸುಭೋಗೀ ಸರ್ವಜ್ಞಾನ ಪ್ರಸೂತಿ ಭೋಜಗರಿಕರ ಪ್ರೀತ ಯೀಷ ಸವೋ ವ್ಯಾತ್ ಸಿಮಲತನು ಯೋಗದೋ ಯೋಗಯುಕ್ತ ಯೋಗೇನ ಚಿತ್ತ ಪದೇನ ವಾಚಾ ಮಲ ಶರೀರ ವೈದ್ಯಕೇನ ಯೋಪಾಕರೋತ್ತ ಪ್ರವರ ಮುನೀನ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಪ್ರಾಂಜಲಿರಾನತೋಸ್ಮಿ ಆಹು ಪುರುಷಾಕಾರ ಶಂಖಚಕ್ರಸಿಧಾರಿಣ ಸಹಸ್ರಶಿರಸ ಶ್ವೇತ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಅನಂತ ನಾಗರಾಜ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಪಾತಂಜಲ ಮಹಾಭಾಷ್ಯ ಚರಕ ಪ್ರತಿಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ ಮನೋವಾಕ್ಯ ದೋಷಾಂ ಹರ್ತ್ರೇ ಅಹಿಪತ ನಮಃ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟುಡೆ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸೂತ್ರ ಪ್ರಚ್ಛರ್ದನ ವಿಧಾರಣಾಭ್ಯಾಂ ವಾ ಪ್ರಾಣಸ್ಯ ಇನ್ ದ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ಸೂತ್ರ ಪತಂಜಲಿ ಶೇರ್ಡ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಸ್ ಸರ್ಟನ್ ಆಟಿಟ್ಯೂಡ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ what is called maitri karuna mudita and upeksha four attitudes he talks about what we should share in our life <coughs> as a very important aspect of our evolution and bringing some peace of mind or softness in the mind pleasantness in the mind as he uses the word chitta prasadanam a pleasantness a sweetness in the mind in this section we are discussing what are the different methods that are available to bring the mind to a very quiet and calm state so patanjali has presented certain ideas because the goal of yoga is what is called samadhi which is to help bring the mind to a state of steadiness stability so that it is able to connect with some focus object of focus because remember all of our uh, goal in the first chapter and the second chapter of patanjali so yoga sutra is that we have to bring the mind to steadiness and stability so that it can connect with an object of focus through the process of meditation for meditation to happen there needs to be a connection that is when a meditation uh, can start a meditative process can start for that connection to happen the mind has to be steady otherwise it cannot hold the process of meditation dharana dhyanam samadhi starts with dharana which literally means to hold that means the mind has to hold an object of focus now how can the mind hold an object of focus when it is unsteady for example let's say for example you are uh, taking a metaphor you want to have a glass of water so you hold an empty glass and somebody is pouring water into the glass 
but when you are holding this glass let us say your hand is so unsteady that the water the glass is shaking the container is shaking <coughs> it could be because your hand is shaking or it could be because the container is on a surface that is shaking for example a moving car or a moving scooter etc where there is not the steadiness for the container somebody pours water what happens the container cannot hold the water the water is wasted in the same manner when the mind as a container is not steady and stable it cannot hold the object of focus that is why patanjali is insisting that the first process is to bring the mind to a state of steadiness or attention so he has been presenting some of the tools like ishvara pranidhana etc as well as maitri karuna mudita upeksha etc now he presents one more mechanism which is called parachardana vidharana abhyam va pranasya a very beautiful sutra he says pranasya prachardanam pranasya vidharanam it's a very interesting way in which we can interpret this sutra pranasya of the prana prachardanam chardanam prachardanam the word prachardana represents exhalation because it comes from the word chardi to vomit to vomit but prachardanam means to vomit very well that does not mean that means you are not vomiting in a very fast way but you are vomiting in a very symbolic way in a very slow and effective way the reason for the choice of this word is because according to the yoga philosophy mind is not steady because there is toxins in the mind something is sick and that's why we have to remove that sickness this could be physiological this could be psychological this could be emotional it could be spiritual toxins so <clears throat> when we are having some let's say some toxins stuck in the body let us say physiologically we have some toxins that are stuck and it's not going out through the natural channels of waste disposal in our body so we become sick and it starts to come higher and higher up what do we do we have to at some point vomit we are vomiting that which is not very well cooked that which is not very well digested that is why this is called a toxic substance in the body that process of vomiting is not comfortable it's very painful but at the same time once we vomit we feel better the same way <clears throat> when we are removing our system of the toxins through a method that is called pranasya prachardanam to vomit or to eliminate the waste of the body through prana what does it mean through pranayama practice and the word prachardana therefore represents what is called exhalation we are extending the exhalation vidharanam one of the word one of the meaning of the word vidharanam means to extend so we are extending the exhalation now there are many dimensions of meaning to this on the one level when we are agitated when the mind is agitated the breath is very short the breath is short that is what hatha yoga pradipika says chale vate chalam chittam which means that when the <clears throat> wind in the body is fast the mind in the body is also moving very fast mind is disturbed it is not very calm the reverse is also true when the mind is not very calm the breath is also very disturbed so <clears throat> we want to bring the mind to a state of steadiness mind to become more and more quiet the way to access that is through the breath by extending the breathing we are extending the capacity of, of prana and therefore we are indirectly bringing steadiness to the mind that's why all the yoga methods are saying that pranayama is a very good way to influence the mind to a state of quietness and attention later on in the second chapter patanjali will present the idea that pranayama is a very good preparation for dharana it's what makes the mind fit for dharana because 
mind without pranayama cannot be ready for dharana because that will usually be disturbed mind. So that is what is the meaning, the symbolic meaning of this concept prachardhanam vidharanam va pranasya. We are extending the exhalation and this is a very important idea that Acharya Krishnamacharya presents. Krishnamacharya says that extension of the exhalation is one of the best ways to quieten the mind. This also is expressed in the Bhagavad Gita, this also expressed in other texts where prana is the very strong way to influence the mind. There are many reasons for this, both very rational and also very spiritual. When we take a spiritual reason behind this, I would like to quote one of the Upanishads that is called as the Narayana Upanishad. Atha Purusho Havai Narayano Kamayata Prajasraje Yeti Narayana Prano Jayate Manasarvendriyanicha Kamayur Jyoti Rapa Prithavi Vishwasya Dharini in this Upanishad that is known as the Narayana Upanishad, it says very simply that from the divine came prana first. So prana is the first manifestation of the divine. But that's not the end of the story. From prana came the mind. Narayana prano jayate manas sarvendriyani cha Prana created mind, that created the senses, etc. And then the elements evolved. So there is a hierarchy that is being presented. So therefore, <clears throat> for example, when the body is agitated, the indriyas are agitated, the mind is agitated, etc. It's very visible that they are all agitated. And when you look at it from a point of view of evolution, suppose you agitate something that is preceding something, <clears throat> then all the succeeding ones will be agitated. So if mind is agitated, then senses will be agitated, the body, physiological bhutas, the elements will be agitated, right? It's very logical <clears throat> because from the mind evolve the senses, from that evolves the elements. So there is a hierarchy that is presented. So the same way, when mind is agitated, these fellows are agitated. So the reverse is also true. When the mind is calm and steady and quiet, senses are steady, elements in the body are steady and healthy. So if that is the case, then our goal is, okay, let us make the mind healthy. But mind health, making the mind quiet is not so easy. Therefore, if we extend that theory further, if we go one step even further and make the prana steady. Then all the succeeding ones become steady as well because prana is what influences the mind, that is what influences senses, that is what influences the elements. So the moment we go to the source, the source, then everything becomes steady. If you look at it metaphorically, if you take a metaphor where you are going to the river and suppose uh, you take the river Ganga. Now the river Ganga unfortunately today is very dirty because a lot of people are putting a lot of dirty things in the Ganga so it's polluted and it's quite dirty. Suppose <clears throat> this, the source itself is polluted, the Ganga where it is originating from, it is a spring. Then the entire river will be dirty. Whereas, let us say the impurities only start from one point onwards, from that point onwards it will be dirty. So, same way when you clean it, if you clean only from one point onwards, only from that point till the end it may be clean, but it may not be clean because the source is still dirty and that is continuing to flow. Therefore, if you go to the source itself and remove the cause of the dirt from the source, then the entire river is clean. And that is what this metaphor is about because what Patanjali is saying, go clean the prana because prana is the first evolute or first manifestation of the divine. From 
before we are created energy was created our energy was created so prana is the first manifestation in us so the moment we are purifying that we are stabilizing that the whole chain of events that it influences becomes more and more stable the reason i also choose this metaphor is because in vedic teaching prana is always associated with rivers when you look at the nadis ida pingala etc they are all given names of rivers ganga yamuna saraswati ganga is considered the ida nadi yamuna is considered the pingala nadi saraswati is considered the sushumna nadi these are the names of the three major vedic rivers ganga yamuna saraswati so why they have said this is the same metaphor that prana is flowing like a river and the more that is made quiet the more that it will influence what it is nourishing it will influence what it is nourishing because take the metaphor of the river itself the river is not only is not only flowing but it's also making the land fertile the soil fertile it is giving water to the people it is giving water to the animals it is nourishing the same way the prana is not just flowing it's influencing the soil in which it is flowing through the elements in the body the senses in the body the mind structure in the body that's why we need to work on that so that the mind becomes more quiet more clean more pure so that is why <clears throat> patanjali is saying prachardana vidharana bhyam va pranasya the sutra can be understood slightly differently as well prachardanam va pranasya prachardanam va pranasya vidharanam va the sutra can also be interpreted slightly differently which is two different ways in the first way the word vidharanam can also come from the root dharana to hold so vidharana means to hold very carefully to hold very well and one of the interpretations that has been given by acharya krishna macharya in this is the concept of holding after exhalation so not only extending the exhalation but also holding after exhalation this is what is called bahya kumbhaka the retention after exhale what the retention after exhale is doing is actually it's nourishing the exhalation the retention component of the breathing is actually nourishing the purpose of that component it is following so if you hold after exhale it nourishes the function of exhalation if you hold after inhale it nourishes the function of inhale in this context the exhalation hold is mentioned or we can interpret it this way now what is the function of exhalation literally what are we doing when we are exhaling we are exhaling toxic waste from the breath in a scientific way we can understand but this is not the only one it is not just physiological toxin but it's also at various other levels exhalation relaxes our muscular structure as well we are really relaxing the muscles therefore hold after exhale will nourish that relaxation so in one way you can say that exhalation will trigger what is called the relaxation response in the body and many scientists have started studying this since 1960s already and it's started lot of a great amount of research have been done on this about what is called the benefits of relaxation response but what actually happens in the when the body becomes more and more relaxed is that there is less and less toxins because the more and more we are stressed we live in a state of stress response the body is going to send the hormones that are necessary for us to deal with stress therefore we are going to get stress hormones even though we don't need it and that becomes toxic sometimes when we have something that is not needed or that is in excess capacity then it becomes toxic for example <clears throat> let's say you eat some food even though it can be organic food can be organic potato chips but if you eat 5 kg of it you are going to become sick because it is not that it's just organic that is important it is also how much if you have more than what it is needed in the body it becomes toxic 
So the same way the, there is all these toxins that are produced. But there is also another dimension that is presented in the yoga system which we say that somehow when we are experiencing our life we acquire what is called vasanas, impressions from the past. We all have experiences from our past which leaves an impression. Now this impression can be strong, the impression can be weak. Now that impression that we have can be conscious, that impression can be unconscious. Now whether it is conscious or unconscious, that impressions continue to stay with us and they start to influence our behavior and sometimes what yoga says is when the impressions their strength begins to grow, they kind of block the flow of prana. They create tension in the body conscious or unconscious. And this is what great acharyas they are all calling this as granthi and not. Acharya Krishna Acharya also talks about this. Nadi granthishu jananan labdhva mamse koshe vridhing gatva. Sandhishu leela natanam gritva rogo yoga nashyati ha ha. So he is also talking about how disease originates in the nadis and then forms the granthis because the granthi is an obstacle to the flow of prana. The prana is not moving, it is almost like a, a barrier, it is a knot. The best example I can give is when I see my mother working in the garden, she has this little pipe for watering the plants, it is like a hose and she is going everywhere to water the plants. So the water when it is flowing smoothly in the pipe, the water flows smoothly, there is no obstacle and you can see that at the end the water comes with good force. But because she is going around the garden like this, like that, suddenly sometimes there is a knot that is formed in the pipe. This is what is granthi. The literal meaning of the word granthi is a knot. Now the moment that knot is formed, what happens? There is the flow of prana, water gets affected. The water is not coming out in the same uh, force. So mother gets agitated, she is trying to shake the uh, pipe. But eventually she has to go and unknot the granthi so that the water will flow once again. The same is happening in our pipes, the nadis, the channels through which prana are flowing. Sometimes because of these tensions, certain obstacles are formed in the body that makes our system very tight and not letting go. Now exhalation is the process of letting go. When you are saying that you have to let go, the muscles have to relax. When you are holding something very tight, you are not letting go. But you have to let go at an emotional level, at a physiological level, at a psychological level, at a spiritual level, some things that have happened to us in the past, the impressions that we carry from the past, the vasanas could be some traumatic incidences. Sometimes maybe somebody beat us when we were young, we were bullied in school. Maybe that has left an impression or maybe we suffered something from uh, our parents or from somebody else in the neighborhood or maybe an accident that we had. Different forms of experiences that are painful leave very deep impressions that we hold on to. The more and more we hold on to them at a psychological level, at an emotional level, the more these granthis or knots will form in the body blocking the flow of prana. Whereas when we are exhaling and holding after exhale, we are convincing the system at various levels that there is nothing to fear, it is okay to let go because holding on is a fear response. For example, when you watch a movie that is very scary, you are holding the chair or you are holding your partner's hands. In some cases, if you are going alone, you try to reach out unconsciously to the hand of the guy sitting next to you, which can be good, which can be shocking for that guy and create trauma in that person. But we are holding. So holding on to things is a fear response. That's why when people are like a victim of something and they keep holding on to the victim role, either individually or as a society, this is also based on fear, not based on confidence. When you look at many of the 
bad experiences that has happened in the social history you take uh, events from the world war time or events from war between india and pakistan or war in the middle east and things like that people hold on to these roles of the victim to these bad memories because of fear response not because of a relaxation response whereas when you are relaxing you let go of all this you are not really stuck so that's why acharya krishnamacharya interprets this as exhalation and hold after exhalation so that the system becomes a bit more relaxed and you are able to let go of the trauma whether you know about it or not sometimes we live in a modern era where we want to know everything but sometimes we cannot know everything because the impressions that we may carry are subconscious and sometimes may have happened before we were having a cognitive mind structure so we don't really have a form for that experience but the vasana is real it's influencing us why do we have that behavior we don't know so this process of exhalation hold after exhalation is a very powerful way in which we can reduce these experiences and this is very beautifully also explained in the hatha yoga pradipika in the fourth chapter where they say there are two reasons for the disturbance of the mind one is the breath one is the vasanas if you agitate your breath what is called vata prakopa you will agitate the mind the other one is vasanas these are what we talked about the experiences hatha yoga pradipika in the same context says you reduce the influence of one the other will also be ready influenced it means if you reduce the agitation of the breath the other two will be reduced it says what are the other two the influence of vasanas as well as the disturbance of the mind the same way if you reduce the influence of vasanas your breath will become under control your mind will become under control or if you reduce the agitation in the mind the breath will be less agitated the vasanas will be less strong so any of the three combination is possible but sometimes not all the options are accessible to us therefore patanjali says use breathing because it's very easy and tangible you can feel your breath when you are breathing in breathing out you can feel it so hold hold on to this as your focus do it as if it's a meditation on the breathing focus on the breath and extend the breath again and again especially focused on the exhalation and the hold after exhalation so that the body is going slowly and systematically into what is called a state of deep relaxation relaxation is not sleeping please remember that in uh, modern times many people say they are teaching relaxation method and just putting people to sleep that is not necessarily considered relaxation in our context in our context relaxation is letting go and feeling very stable and relaxed at the same time it's a state of what is called sthira and sukha both at the same time to be attentive and relaxed at the same time it's not just falling off asleep that is one way of relaxing but that is not what yoga is talking about because yoga wants our mind to be active not sleepy so many people who are marketing sleeping methods as yoga techniques are somehow playing with marketing not really involved in too deeply into yoga so we have to reflect on that so exhalation hold after exhalation is one way of interpreting this there's another way of interpreting this which is what is called vidharanam dharana vidharana dharana also means in some context inhalation so pracchardana pranasya pracchardanam va pranasya vidharanam va which means you extend both inhale and exhale extend exhale and inhale which is what is the concept of pranayama what we call dirgha and sukshma we want our inhalation and exhalation to come to a quality which is what is called dirgha and sukshma long not only long but also very refined smooth now this is very important and the sequence in which they are saying is very interesting pracchardana first then vidharanam exhalation extension then inhalation extension this is very important because 
in the yoga uh, studies when you go deep into yoga studies you realize that the exhalation is the container for inhalation the more you clean the system the more you can fill the system for example i have a glass of water the more i empty it <coughs> the more i can fill it if i only empty half a glass i can only fill half a glass so inhalation depends on the exhalation it's depending on the foundation of exhalation and it is usually the boundary of exhalation that's why in yoga system we are never asking people to exhale long sorry inhale longer than the exhalation we will never say do 10 seconds inhale 5 seconds exhale the reverse we can say to 5 seconds inhale 10 seconds exhale is okay but not the reverse because exhalation is the boundary for inhalation it's like this you have a jar of a bottle which can have the capacity of 500 milliliters you cannot fill you know 1 liter in that whereas if you have a capacity of 1 liter you can fill half a liter it's okay but the reverse is not possible that's why i keep saying exhalation is the boundary for inhalation so here what is being offered is a very interesting method where both exhalation and inhalation are asked to be increased with focus first on the exhalation with focus first on the exhalation not the inhalation already first this is very important and it's also important here in this context to clarify because very often when we look at yoga text the classical yoga text there is a strong emphasis on inhalation and hold after inhalation the classic ratio of pranayama that is often presented is one duration of inhale four duration of hold after inhale two units of exhalation one unit of hold after exhalation so four hold after inhale is given which means the emphasis on inhalation but this is for the highest hatha yogis and even there if you notice my friends it is one inhale of one unit of inhale two units of exhale it's only the hold after inhale that is increased and this is because uh, the inhale is the boundary for the exhale so that's why the inhalation is one exhalation is two the way we nourish the vitality of inhalation is by bringing the hold after inhale but that forms another separate topic of discussion which is not in the context of sutras but coming back to this sutra this is very very significant because when we adopt either of these options whether it is extension of exhalation and hold after exhalation or extension of exhalation and consequently the extension of inhalation when we adopt either of these strategies the mind comes to a very quiet place the mind is not going to be disturbed the mind is going to be more and more quiet that is why when you look at all the yoga texts classical texts not only yoga texts but also vedic texts which are talking about meditation etc pranayama is always presented before meditative practices are offered because without pranayama meditation cannot happen when you look at patanjali's yoga sutra in the second chapter he presents pranayama before dharana dhyanam and samadhi when you look at hatha yoga pradipika pranayama along with mudras are presented before the nada methods when you look at the mantra yoga schools where mantras are taught they say mantra japa must always be preceded by pranayama practice because that is what makes the mind very quiet so that mantras can become effective so all these are very important ways in which patanjali is saying focus on pranayama so that the mind becomes clean and ready for meditation and other profound and subtle tools of yoga at this point it is also very important to talk about what will happen if this is not done which is our modern era we all don't care about pranayama we just care about how nicely and attractively asanas uh, are looking when we are practicing then we take a picture put it on facebook or instagram to get hundreds and thousands of likes so that people are very happy with us and our beautiful performance but we are not really focused on the breathing be it in asana practice or be it beyond the asana practice in other yoga practices we are not really practicing pranayama in the in the manner where we are extending the breath to become dirgha and sukshma 
what happens to the peril of that what is the dangers of this now it's like if you don't remove the toxins in the body and continue to nourish what is within then what happens the toxins get nourished and that is what happens in the field when we are having a farm and there are some plants which are good we want to have some nice mangoes trees that are growing but there's a lot of all these poisonous plants as well which is in the land which we are not removing then what happens when we nourish that farm with water and sunlight etc maybe the mango will grow but also the poisonous plants will grow and eventually maybe the poisonous plants will kill the mango plant and just become a wild poisonous farm the same happens to us if we remove the focus on prana if we remove the focus on prana then the negative vasanas are nourished not removed it's almost like we are giving energy to the dark side as we see now in the star wars movies we are nourishing the dark side if we remove the focus on prana and that is why we we all start to become sick in various ways physically emotionally psychologically spiritually and when you look at the yoga world today where many people are practicing without the focus on prana yoga is not actually doing healthy things for such people and that's why there are so many articles and uh, videos and other things which many people are sharing that not all yoga is good or yoga is bad etc because some of the times this yoga without the focus on prana brings forward darkness rather than brightness and this is why there is a great responsibility for all of us in the yoga field to focus on the prana texts like yoga rahasya of nathamuni say not only that if we remove the focus on the prana that yoga practices are not useful but they actually say they will create disease and they are not talking only about physiological disease they are talking about all the diseases in all the different layers of our system physical emotional energetic spiritual etc because that is the power of prana so we have to look at it in this way so we when we deeply engage with yoga and we understand the yoga principles we can look at this as prana is the gift from the divine it's the first manifestation of the divine so we take that gift and treat it like a gift and nourish it we focus on that we take good care of it then what happens that will nourish the positive things and mind senses and body and other dimensions will come to a state of harmony whereas when we take this gift of prana and abuse it or ignore it then it starts to nourish other things that are not necessarily positive and therefore we end up in trouble prana in itself is not bad don't think that some people have positive energy some people have dark energy it's not the truth it just nourishes the dark vasanas like i said to you the example the sun is shining all the time and the sunlight is reaching everybody the sunlight does not discriminate this person is good person i will shine on this person this person is bad person i will not shine on this person both the good person and the bad person gets nourished by the sunlight both a good society and a bad society gets nourished by the sunlight there is no discrimination that the sunlight is doing it does not discriminate no but what we do with the sunlight what we do with that nourishment some people nourish themselves to become fighters some people nourish themselves to become good servants of society that is their decision and dependent on what impressions they are carrying the same way prana does not differentiate prana will nourish both good and bad that doesn't make it that it is bad energy it is good energy 
if it nourishes the bad side then it starts giving the dark side more strength the negative sides more strength whereas if we allow the prana to nourish the positive instead then that case starts to gain more strength to quote that there is a saying in our tradition where they say prabalena durbalasya badaha by making something positive more stronger we make the negative weaker we don't have to kill the negative we cannot because that is also part of our system there are shadow sides in our system there are dark seeds because there is nobody in this world who has not had a bad vasana who has not had bad experiences in life that are still carried what we choose to nourish is will determine what kind of person we will become and behave and that is why patanjali is using this method to say the more and more you are extending the exhalation and hold after the exhalation the more you focus on the breath and the more longer you make the breath the more positive your experience will be because the process of exhalation itself is reducing the power of the toxins so that is why there is this beautiful sutra prachardana vidharana abhyam va pranasya 